Last time we talked about how China was the great breeding ground of pandemics and how the China virus was the first man-made, genetically engineered virus in human history. And we also talked about how the creator of the China virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, the disease, was none other than Dr. Shi Zhang Li. Dr. Shi was, of course, trained in the United States at several U.S. labs. But what might surprise people to learn is that not only was she trained in the United States in gain-of-function research to make viruses, coronaviruses specifically, more deadly and infectious, she was also funded by the United States funded using your tax dollars and mine in carrying out this dangerous, reckless research. How that came about is a story unto itself. One of the principal cheerleaders of -of gain-of-function research from the get-go was the now famous, or infamous if you prefer, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci was arguing soon after it became possible to genetically manipulate viruses of all kinds, including coronaviruses. He was arguing that it made sense to engineer in the lab highly infectious and highly deadly viruses in order to anticipate nature. His argument was that from time to time, zoonosis occurs Deadly viruses cross over the species barrier into humanity, and we have no defense against it. And so in order to devise a defense, he argued, we need to create monster viruses in the lab. We need to anticipate the next zoonosis, create deadly and infectious viruses in the lab using gain-of-function technology, and then develop therapeutic drugs to cure them and vaccines to immunize people against them. That was his argument, and he made it everywhere in the early years of this century, including in the pages of an editorial in the Washington Post. Other people, more sober and sensible, and I would say saner people, argued that this was a very, very dangerous venture. They said, Tony, uh, your idea to create Frankenstein viruses in the lab is fine. But what happens if your Frankenstein virus, your highly infectious and deadly virus that you created using gain-of-function research, escapes from the lab before you have a therapeutic drug to cure it and a vaccine to immunize people against it? What happens then? You've just unleashed a plague on humanity, Tony. Well, I don't think Dr. Fauci had any answer to that. And as a result, in 2014, in the United States, there was a moratorium placed on gain-of-function research. American labs, like the lab run by Dr. Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina, were informed that the NIH, and specifically the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease that Dr. Fauci has run for decades now, would no longer be funding supporting gain-of-function research. Now, presumably, Dr. Fauci was very unhappy with that decision because he was the principal advocate of -of gain-of-function research. And what happened then was very interesting because he began to fund a group called EcoHealth Alliance run uh, by a Dr. Ebright. And Dr. Ebright, in turn, began working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China to not only collect coronaviruses from bats, which was the direction the research was already going, but he also began to work with them on doing gain-of-function research. So what happened when American researchers were forbidden from doing gain-of-function research is that a workaround was found so that money could be sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology to Dr. Barrick and uh, Dr. Fauci's friend, 
Dr. Shi Zhang Li, so she could continue to do gain of function research, not in violation of the moratorium because that was in the United States, but sort of a workaround from the moratorium because the money went to Eco Health Alliance in New York, and then from there it went to a subcontractor, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So you see, in my view, Dr. Anthony Fauci found a way to continue his dangerous gain of function research. Now I'm willing to grant that Dr. Anthony Fauci may have merely been interested in advancing the frontiers of human knowledge, that he thought creating monster viruses in the lab was a wonderful way to anticipate and hopefully to stop the next epidemic uh, that began with a, a natural crossing from, from bat to man or from pangolin to man or from marmot to man. But in fact, I'm also willing to say that the Chinese Communist Party saw it in very, very different terms. They saw the United States foolishly not only handing over the technique to make a dangerous and deadly bioweapon, but also, unbelievably, to actually fund the development of such a bioweapon. Because remember, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, according to our own intelligence services, was working with the People's Liberation Army's bioweapons program. So we not only trained Dr. Schur in the techniques of how to develop a bioweapon unwittingly, we also funded her efforts to do just that. So she was taught and funded by us. And the result was the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, as the World Health Organization likes to call it. I like to call it the China virus, as you all know because it came from China. As for the release of the virus, once they had the virus ready in the lab, they had one more step to go through before releasing it upon the world. They needed a vaccine to protect their own people against the virus, the deadly virus they had created. And so I believe by early 2019 at the latest, they had the China virus ready to go, and they were working on a vaccine. And I believe that it was during vaccine trials in the fall of 2019 that the virus escaped into the population at large. You see, because China has never used and does not now use the mRNA vaccines, the little snippet of genetic material that tricks your cells into making uh, the spike protein. They use a traditional vaccine, which is to say a dead or attenuated, weakened version of the original virus to prompt an immune response in the human being who's injected with it so that they don't get a, an infection from the, the more deadly and, uh, and infectious virus itself. But sometimes when you're using an attenuated vaccine, a weakened version of the real thing that has a weakened version of the virus in it, a weakened version of the real virus in it, you can actually come down with the disease itself. And I believe because the vaccine was defective that they were using, that the virus itself escaped into the population at large. Remember, this was a virus that was designed, engineered to be highly infectious. It escaped into the population itself, and from that point on, there was no stopping it in China. And what the Chinese Communist Party did then was a crime against humanity. Because what the Chinese Communist Party did then, when they had an epidemic on their hands in the city of Wuhan, was they stopped flights from Wuhan from going to other Chinese cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou. But they allowed flights from Wuhan to travel to cities around the world like Milan, Madrid, two of the early centers of the pandemic outbreaks in Europe. They allowed flights to go to Los Angeles and New York City. So they stopped flights within their own country to try to stop the spread of the, the China virus, but they allowed flights to continue around the world using their own people as innocent human disease vectors to spread the disease around the world, causing the pandemic. So when people ask me, did the virus leak from the lab? or was it deliberately released? The answer is both. It 
leaked from the lab in a sense during vaccine trials because it infected people with the real disease. And after that, it was deliberately spread around the world by a, a deliberate decision of the Chinese Communist Party leaders to bring down the rest of the world. They were not going to let China suffer alone through the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, they set out to make it a pandemic. That's exactly what they did. And the result is millions of dead and trillions and trillions of dollars in economic damage. That was all deliberate and China should be held to account for every death and every dollar lost.